Hello there, fight friends. Andy Cotter with MMA.ca here. And we have a special guest today, as you can see on your screen. You know who he is already. Eamon Zahabi, fighting at UFC 289 this week in Vancouver against Mongolian fighter. Now, I know I'm going to get his name wrong. And I think, it, depending where I look, it's either written as one word, one name, or two names. But I think it's Ar Arori Quile Quileng. <laughs> Eric Lang. I say I say it Eric Lang. I say it one word. <laughs> oh, know. it's almost like Ricky Lane that or Ricky Lang. There's that, that, yeah. that movie. So anyway, so you're fighting a, a Ricky Lang uh, this Saturday. So this is exciting time. UFC Fight Week. There's nothing quite like it. Like you, yep. you've been through a bunch. I've been through a bunch, not as a fighter, but just as media. Like in the in the fight venue, in the hotel, in the city. It's it's absolutely yeah. thrilling. There's almost nothing like it. How are you feeling right now? I feel fantastic. I feel really good about the fight. I feel really good about my weight. I saw my opponent here in the hotel this morning, so the fight's on. Things are, are looking good. Things are positive. Now, when you see him and you get that first view, did you see him first? Did he see you? Was there any kind of like, did, did you hide so he wouldn't see you? Or how does that work? No, no, I'm not going to hide. But the, I was going down the escalator from the conference room where like, we do like check-ins and poster signings and things like that. And he was on his way up, you know, two escalators side by side. So as he was coming up, I was coming down. I went, I reached over and I shook his coach's hand and his hand. And I said hello and I introduced myself. And we just kept moving on, right? Like, uh, I'm not afraid of him. No, you know? no. And uh, it's just business in the end. It's just business. You know, we're yeah. here to fight. But I'm a martial artist and I think he's more of a traditional guy too. I don't think he's mm -hmm. much of a trash talker. I don't know how, if he speaks English or not or how well his English is. But he doesn't give me that air of uh, cockiness and disrespect either. Yeah, nor do you. And it's funny you mention that because years ago there was a sort of viewpoint that Fighters had to be really hyper aggressive and hyper masculine, whatever that means. And they were, you know, eyeing down their opponent and giving them the stare down and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, your team, TriStar, you're, you're more of a cerebral team. Of course, your brother Frost, the head coach. And it's more like a thinking man's team. It's not a bunch of hooligans running around. You're right. You're a professional. So, I mean, this is just a guy and, and he's the guy you're going to have to go through and you don't have to hate him to fight him. Is that right? That's 100% right. You know, I trained my whole life. You know, to master myself so I can go out there and, and beat other guys to show them that I'm the better fighter. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with anything personal. Like, I don't care about his personal life. Like, you know, I, I wish him the best in his personal life. Now, you know, fans are in such a good spot these days. They have so much ability to see fighters and interact with fighters, especially with the advent of social media. I noticed that you've been really busy in the past few days putting out a bunch of stuff with different, uh, different uh, social media providers. And they get to see you and they get to see your life. So it's kind of weird from my point because, you know, what do I talk to you about that people haven't seen before? Like they, and as a fan, I'm sure you've done this before, whether it's fighting or another sport, you, you, you see an athlete and you kind of feel like you get to know them, even though you might never have met them. Like I've never met you personally, but I know you a little bit just from watching you now. So what, yeah, of course. what, what is something that we can talk about right now that people don't know, about you, they might not realize. Putting you on the spot. I mean, here. I don't know. Like I'm uh... I don't, know, I don't know what people don't know, really, but, uh, you know, I'm a family man. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Like, uh, when I'm not in the gym, gym training, I like to spend time with my wife and kids, and I like to do things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very, very focused on uh, on my family, and I spend a lot of time with my kids. You know, like, even one time, you know, during COVID, uh, during the six months when everything was basically, like, locked down mm -hmm. and daycares were closed and all those things, like, the, the, you know, the first part of the pandemic, when we took it super serious, uh, my wife's work stayed open because they were considered essential okay. so i was a stay-at-home dad for six months no daycare with twin girls <laughs> that were 18 months old you know like uh, not a lot not too many people know that you know and yeah. like i would spend all day and night with them and what i was doing because i didn't know if the ufc was going to call me for a fight so you know i'd wake them up in the morning have them breakfast take them out for a walk and whatever and everyone's nap time i put them to bed and then i would train i used to live in a condo mm -hmm. So I would train in the driveway, and I'm sure my neighbors thought I was nuts because nobody at the time knew I was a fighter in my neighborhood until I knocked out Draco. Then all of a sudden, everybody knew who I was. You know, that really put me on the mm -hmm. map. But uh, I was training in, the, in my driveway there, and I'm sure people thought it was weird. And then I trained for 45 minutes, go back in, uh, shower, get ready. When the kids woke up, boom, I would start spend the rest of the day <laughs> with them until my wife came home. And then I would go train with my brother or, or somebody mm -hmm. else, you know. And uh, it was just a tough time, but not too many people know that. And in that time, I also uh, potty trained my daughters. So that's something a lot of people don't know. What are you... I, tra I potty trained them early. I was like, listen, we got. they said we're going to close for two weeks. I'm like, I can potty train them in two weeks. You know, so anyways, so, uh, those are a couple of things that people don't know. What are you more proud of, having a first round knockout in the UFC or potty training your twin daughters? I mean, overcoming the two losses in a row was huge. Mm -hmm. Huge, mm -hmm. huge, huge. 
Body training twins, it wasn't easy either, guys. Like, what they were both split on me in the corner. I had to chase them around <laughs> with a body. <laughs> But it was it was all fun times. They were both great. They're both fantastic. It, it's so it's so nice to hear that. I had a really nice chat with Kyle Nelson last week, and he's also fighting on the same card as you. And he's a family man as well. Yep. And he told me about how he had to evolve his his viewpoint towards fighting and training once he became a father. Because when you're single, you you can be very selfish. You can have all your time to yourself. You can have everything you want for yourself. But now it's different, isn't it? You've got to make time for everyone else that's important to you. And it's just, like arguably just as important, if not more important to you and your 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 well-being that your family's happy. Yeah, 100%. Even on this last Sunday before I flying out, I had to mow the lawn of my house. I had things to do, <laughs> make sure before I leave that my wife and kids are all set up and the house is ready. It's going to be okay for them. You know, my wife's a working woman as well, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the dream for me is to make so much money. She'll never have to work a day in her life, but we're not there yeah, yet. Not there yet. We're on our way. You know, once we get that UFC title, then we can start thinking about that. But uh, for now, you know, I just got to make sure that when I'm away, things are handled and she could be fine with the girls and the, the, everything's okay for them while I'm away. So speaking of the UFC title, that's something that you don't, I don't hear you speak about often. And your division is so stacked. There's so many fighters. Tell me about, like, I, I know your, your brother Frost, and forgive me, I don't want to turn this into the Frost conversation, but people talk about Frost yeah, being no very cerebral and, and, and a thinking man's coach. How yeah. far in advance do you plan, and, and how do you sort of prepare for the timeline that you need to, to get to that point where you're fighting for a title? Well, no, the, the, really the real secret is we focus on the fight, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about me mastering myself. If I have no, no gaps in my game, how is anybody going to beat me, mm -hmm. right? So it's not about looking outward. It's about looking inward. So that's, you know, that's one thing that, you know, I don't fight very often, but during that, my time off, I'm always bettering myself mm -hmm. and I'm rebuilding my confidence. Like now I feel like I have more confidence than my, my fight in Madison Square Garden just before mm -hmm. I lost. Like I, I feel even better now than then. And um, a lot of it has to do with focusing on yourself, increasing your strengths, of course, but also minimizing your weaknesses in your game and just bettering yourself. If, if you become unstoppable, you can make your way to the title. Don't worry about other guys. You should only focus on yourself. I feel like we could probably sit here and talk for two hours about the concept of the self and what that means and how important it is. And I, I think yeah. a lot of people don't really even, they're not even cognizant of that. That's a, that's a concept. Yeah, of course. You know, and a lot of people focus on the other guy, the other guy. No, no, mm -hmm. no. It's you. It's you and yourself in there. You know, like I, sometimes when I talk about this, and people don't always take it the, the best way. But I really feel like my two losses, I lost to myself. I made the, I made the mistakes. Yeah, my opponents, they did their job in doing what they had to do. But I also cost myself those fights, you know. And I think the, my 50, my share of the blame, you know. And I don't think they got lucky or anything. I just think that I let myself down and I made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm always trying to eliminate my mistakes. You might not realize it, but we're touching on a, a on a very familiar concept that we talk about in the military. Because I had a military background. And that's personal responsibility. Yes. Because at the end of the day, you... you whether you like to say it or not, every success, every failure, every everything in your life, that's based on your personal responsibility. So unless you can accept personal responsibility for the failures in your life, how can you expect to accept the responsive or sorry, the, 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 the successes in your life? I mean, it's everything's up to you. You know, did you put in enough training? Did you plan enough? Did you get enough sleep? All that kind of stuff. So it's good to hear that you're talking yeah. about this kind of stuff. Yeah, of course. And it makes a lot of sense that it's coming from the military. That's all they do is just focus on how to improve, how to be, mm -hmm. go better, right? They can't take a loss, right? You don't want to no. take a loss. You're talking about human lives yeah. on, at stake, right? So that's how you got to kind of prepare for yourourself when you go in there to a fight, right? Because a fight is like a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. battle. It's a one-on-one -on -one war, right? So you need to have that kind of military mindset as well to go in there, you know? And actually, I was talking about it on another podcast. Like, you know, a lot of times people, they, they, they judge coaches on their decisions in the corner, let's say, for example, but like you're sending your soldier out to war in that in that mm -hmm. cage, right? So like you you should know them inside and out. And if you're making that decision, you know that fighter better than the fans do. And sometimes you know they're capable of more, and you're sending them out, but the fans don't see it. But you know it inside that he can maybe reach deep down and make it work for himself. And you gotta give him his chance, right? You gotta give him his chance. So it's a it's a very complicated, mm -hmm. very uh, emotional, very stressful, very thought out process that fighters and coaches have to deal with about mm -hmm. being successful in terms of fighting that's right 100 percent uh so i live in st Catharines, ontario and that's also the town where a niagara top theme is which is a really popular and busy gym in southern ontario yeah. now because of that i get to speak with a lot of fighters from this area from from top team uh and one thing yeah. that's very similar between them and, and tristar is that 
it's a really bustling gym with a lot of people. You've got a lot of different skill levels, a lot of different people, yeah. a lot of a lot of weight classes. Tell me how important it is to a, being a, a success in the UFC to have that in your backyard that you can just go into a room at TriStar and you know there's a bunch of world class fighters there that can help you hone yourself. Well, if it's priceless, really, it's really priceless to have the different levels of guys in the room so that you can climb up, you know, and like us, we have a philosophy where 30% of your training should be with guys lesser than you. 30% should be with guys your level and 30% should be above, you know. So if you're like a big fish in a small pond and everyone's below you, you're missing something in your yeah. training, you know. To be a well-rounded fighter, to really understand the game, you need people of all of the levels because, you know, you want to work on your offense and you want to try something new. You got to go with a lesser guy to, de to develop yeah. that new yeah. skill or to develop that new fit or do whatever it is. And once you build it up from that level to the medium level to the, somebody better than you, then you know you have something solid in your hand that you can go use in competition. Yeah, that's right. Like same thing in, in me for jiu-jitsu. Like if, if you're always the guy who's winning, not that I'm always the guy who's winning because I'm not, but if you're always yeah. the guy that's winning, like who's making you better? It's not. You, ha you have to put yourself in those awkward and those, those uncomfortable situations in order to grow. Yeah, of course. But you need sometimes those easier easier rounds too to, to develop something new, something creative. Yeah. You need some sometimes lesser guys to open up your creativity because if you're always fighting only the best of the best, you maybe become too rigid and only use stuff to help you survive. And you're not developing that offense. The, the, the thing is, in fighting, it comes to a point where sometimes you have to go and take it from the guy. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the ability to, to go and take it, sometimes you'll lose a close decision. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's tough too. That hurts the ego yeah. as well. So speaking about ego and something else you just touched on a few minutes ago about those two losses, some people talk, you know, I'm not a professional fighter. I don't know. But some people talk that in order to have success, in order to be really successful, you have to have a loss or two or three under your belt. So you really are able to have those difficult conversations with yourself about your effort and what you're putting into it and all that kind of stuff. So you thought you said that those two losses were kind of a blessing. Where are you now with that? Like, do you think in, in, in a in a in a fighter of your skill level at the apex, which is where you are, you're at the top. Are you able to walk into a fight knowing that defeat is possibility? Because I mean, some people say that losing is not an option. Well, in the military, we always say lo losing is. It's always an option. Now, what are you going to do to mitigate yeah. that, that possibility so it doesn't happen? Yeah, I think it's more. Uh, it comes down to probability. It all comes so there's always a chance of losing, right? But we want to minimize that probability. And I was talking about it uh, the other time, but like when I was fighting Ricky Tercios and he started jumping and screaming and spinning, I was like, hey, I've been knocked out with one too many uh, spinning elbows. I'm not going to let another low probability strike mm -hmm. finish me, you know? But to fight in a way where, you know, I wasn't going to let randomness, as much as randomness, as random as he was acting, really in influence the fight, you know? And that's something that you have to understand that MMA, what's so beautiful about MMA is so many things can happen what to win mm -hmm. and for you to lose like uh spinning elbow flying knees uh tripping up on the fence while you're getting taken down makes you fall in this one awkward position and gives the guy a little bit of your neck he can he can pull it off you know like there's so many types of types of things that can go right or wrong in that cage that there's mm -hmm. always a small chance there's always yeah. a small chance. and you have to be okay with that and like now after coming off those two losses i know that i can always build myself back up I, you know, when I was coming up and I hadn't lost for years, you know, people were calling me a front runner and I've never been through adversity and a lot of people didn't like me, you know. And I just feel like now that I've been to the bottom and back, I can always go back to the bottom mm -hmm. and back. I can, always, I can take a loss and come back five wins in a row, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it doesn't, it's not going to affect me the same way as it did. You know, I'm less emotionally attached now uh, to my record and I'm just looking forward to just building the experience and getting yeah. there. You know, like for me, I've, I've always said it when I was younger. You know, I, I, it took a lot of inspiration from guys like Robbie Lawler or, or anybody who's lost early in their career and who's always made it back. I just find it much harder for a guy to come back than who, who's a guy who's just been undefeated for so yeah. long. You know, it's not easy making that climb back and dealing with the haters and dealing with the social media and dealing with all the, the negative propaganda. You know, it's, it's not easy. You know, people say, oh, I don't care what anybody thinks. But we're social creatures and it affects you to a certain extent. You know, everybody gets affected. Yeah. So we're going to move off topic for a second and just and, and leave talking about you for a minute. Yep. I want to bring up something. I, I know last time we spoke yep. a, a while back, you mentioned to me that in your phone, in your contacts list, you've got him labeled TriStar Tyler. 
And that, of course, is Tyler Wilson, who I just saw have a really terrific win yeah. this past weekend at Durham Flight Theory. He, he, yes, he, he had did. A, a walk-off home run KO punch. That was pretty incredible to watch. Tell me, I mean, you train with him all the time. Tell me, to me, it seems as, a, as just an outsider that he has turned a corner in some way and he's just turned up his game and he's he's yeah. kicking butt now. What What's going on with him? Do you know why that's happening? You know, he, he's immersed in, like one time he came to train with us to just try out in Montreal and he fell in love with TriStar and he moved here. And, uh, you know, he's been getting better ever since. But he went through that rough patch where he lost mm -hmm. a few fights in a row. But you know what he did, man? He kept his head down and never stopped showing yeah. up to practice. Actually, he ended up leaving his job and changed jobs to be able to, you know, like he, he took a less paying job with less hours and all these different things just to be able to commit more mm -hmm. to training. And to make it back and have a lot of respect for him for doing that, right? Because he didn't think about the money. And that's something that's very important. There's a lot of guys that are chasing the dollar. You know, they're doing MMA to make money. But MMA doesn't make no, you money. No, no. Okay? It only makes you money when you're the 1% or the 0.1% of fighters. You're the McGregor. You're the Khabib, you know? A lot of the other guys, we don't make that much money. Like, even me now. Like, I'm making okay. Like, I'm making decent, you know? Thanks to Sean Shelby when he changed my contract on the guy this weight. But before that, I wasn't making a crazy amount of money. And... I liked what that he gave. He he let go of money to improve mm -hmm. his skill and to change his career, and you know it paid off for him. Big We've time. all seen guys in gym, well, and girls, I guess, in gyms across the country that you know are not putting in everything they could. They show up, they do a, a practice here and a practice there, but they're not fully committed. And then they ask themselves a question later on: yeah. Why don't I have success? Why aren't I doing well? Why did I lose that fight? Well, we know the answer, but they have a hard time really understanding that you know, there's a certain amount of effort you need to put in and they're not doing it. Yeah, well, there's a famous quote that says, you don't rise to the level of the occasion, you fall to the level of your mm -hmm. training. So if your training is a low level, you will be low level. If your training is high level, you'll fall to a high level in yeah, the competition. That's, that's right. the truth. Okay, Eamon, I, uh, this is a great conversation. I mean, uh, I'm not going to ask you too much about the fight itself because, uh, well, I guess I, I'll... I, I lie sometimes and I just lied because I just thought now something else to keep talking about. So one of the things I love about mixed martial arts and you, you touched on it briefly was probability. And one of the things I like about mixed martial arts is that you can have two fighters, fighter A and fighter B, and they both have a certain level of preparation. And we'll just say you, for example, so you're preparing for this fight. You have a certain skill set. You've been training, you know what you can do. You've got a great team behind you. And you can sort of plan ahead yeah. what your opponent's going to do. And you look at his skill set, what he's shown in path fight. Yeah. But once that cage door closes and there's only three people in that cage, you really don't know what they are bringing to the table. You, you know what you can bring, but you don't know what they can bring. So I'm not a big fan of sports betting. Like I know some people do it and they bet the odds and all that kind of, I don't even pay attention to any of all that. I just like watching the fights. I, I like watching the, the, the challenge that is the individual meeting the challenge that is the other because those are, can be some pretty powerful things sometimes yeah of course you know and even like even when you prepare for a fight like i used to be very rigid about my my game plans and after the ricky fight and the fight with draco i've realized that i can't be too mm -hmm. strict because when you end up going in the cage they also plan for right. you so they're gonna come in, they're always they're gonna make it a, they're gonna fight a little bit different than they fought previously right so now I have like more of like a loose game plan. I have an idea of what I, where I want the fight to go, but not, I'm not so stuck to it that if things change that I, I panic, I panic that, Oh wait, this is not what I expected mm -hmm. in here. You know? So I've come more with an open mind and basically you got to feel the guy out, you know, and just, if you watch the ultimate fighter last week, I felt horrible for the guy. He got knocked out in like yeah, know, eight yeah. seconds or I'm not sure, maybe 12 seconds, something very, very quick. And both guys ran across the cage and they were just guns blazing. You know, they just, you know, I, I why would you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, why would you do that? If you have a high skill, you're going to finish the guy eventually. Why run over and just brawl with him and, and throw probability out the window? You know, it's just, it's not who's the better fighter. It's who won rock and rock mm -hmm. and him. It, it's super weird. And something like, you know, not to bash MMA because I think MMA is the best sport. But one thing that I find good, nice about boxing is that, you know, they, they they hold defense to a high standard. They appreciate defense. You know, like there's no defense is not one of the judging criteria in MMA. You know, like it, there are boxers in boxing who have won rounds without landing a punch by embarrassing their opponent, not allowing them to even mm -hmm. touch them with a punch. 
you know, being so elusive has won rounds in boxing in the past. You know, there, there is something to say about having a masterful defense, right? You know, there's a great quote when, when you talk about the NFL. I can't remember which coach said it. He said, defense wins Super Bowls, not offense. Yeah. It's defense, man. Defense wins Super Bowls and defense wins championships. So how are you going to go and be the top guy? And if you're just a, a slugger, it's, it's very rare. A slugger who, who wants to do a 50-50 fight is going to be a, a, mm-hmm. a champion with 10 title defenses. It's impossible. Man. You need to have great defense. You know, I, I just find it a weird thing that we, we discourage defense in MMA. I'd have to think more on what you just said about discouraging defense. I'm not sure if I I acknowledge that in all cases, but once again, I think I would have to sit there and think about it. But uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. sure about that. Yeah, think about what they want. They want they want the gaudy fights in MMA. They want guys to just sit there and trade back and forth and hope for a knockout. They don't want to see anybody do, be super mm-hmm. strategic. You know, how, how much more do they like guys when they go out there and and bang, you know, yeah. like let's say, um, who's a great name that we could, the guy, the, the champion at BKFC now when he was in the UFC, Mike, Mike, Perry. Mike Platinum Perry. People used to love him, but he's not really a, a tactician or strategic guy. People, how bad did people talk about GSP? Mm-hmm. You know, how bad did people, GSP, man, he, he did an incredible job. You know, how can you win so many times in a row after being champion? He cleared his division how yeah. many times? Yeah. You know, but he gets disrespected as a boring mm-hmm. fighter. You know, so that's kind of what I'm okay, talking I got about. Some, some people say that, but there are those who appreciate it. Yeah, there are some who appreciate it, but I would say like the mainstream fans, they just want to see blood and guts. I had, a, I was really fortunate last week. I got to speak with AJ McKee, who's a Bellator lightweight. He's got a record of twenty and one, and we were talking about the time that he fought in Japan and how. And I and I know from talking with other fighters in the past that in Japan, the crowds are very different than what we have in North America, where they're very quiet or subdued. They they don't yeah. clap. They don't make a lot of noise. And he said he kind of liked it because it was also – they were also a very educated fan base where if you did, did a move, yes. like a grappling move, it's not like here where, you know, you might be doing top control and some guy on, on the ground and you're there for five minutes and the fan – some fans yeah. might start booing and stand them up and all that kind of stuff in Japan. They yeah. like – they acknowledge and recognize that it takes a lot of skill to be in a dominant position yeah. down there. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, they are the best fans. You notice that in Pride as well and in the, the K1 Heroes that they had. There's so many nice MMA events where you really appreciate mm-hmm. the crowd. You know, that's incredible how educated they are. But that's what I'm saying. See, like people here in the West, in the, you know, North America, they want more blood and guts. They don't really appreciate the ground game, the cage wrestling and things like that. Like I remember my, my friend, uh, Jared Gordon, actually, you know, he ate a lot of flank for having um, what he did to uh, Patty Pimblet in round three. A lot of people were talking bad about that. But, you know, he won round three. I thought he won okay. round three anyway. You know, he controlled. Like, it's not easy to control another grown, skilled no, fighter not. against the kid. It ain't easy. It costs mm-hmm. a lot of energy to, to do that. It, to keep him stuck there and not let him out. It's not, that guy doesn't want to be there. The guy's fighting to get out of there. It's not easy to do, mm-hmm. you know. It's just, it's just, I think we need more. We need to find a way to educate the fans on the level of, level of difficulty of the different grappling situations, mm-hmm. you know, and we need to have a value for each, each one, you know, that could be something interesting. It's kind of tough though. When the UFC president, Dana White, he's so uh, vociferous about his uh, love of, of bangers, right? Like you get two athletes go in there and just whack each other yeah. for 15 minutes and he loves it. And he gives them bonuses and you know, they, they get through the, yeah. the ultimate fighter and they get through Dana White's contender series based on that. When you have, have another fighter, yeah. like at least two or three, I can think of in the past couple of years where they won their fights but they weren't invited into the UFC just because, you know, maybe it was a little bit the boring side. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm talking about, you know? So it sucks. It's not always about the best fighter. It's sometimes it's about mm-hmm. the most entertaining. Well, the last thing I'd like to speak about, unless there's anything else you want to mention, is that you are, of course, fighting in Vancouver, which is in Canada, which is where you are from. Uh, yeah. This has got to be different than anything you've had in the past. Forgive me, I, I didn't think to check this out, but did you fight in Canada before for the UFC? Yeah, I fought, in, I fought in Halifax, mm. my first fight in UFC, and I fought in Ottawa against Vince Morales, and that was my third fight for UFC in Canada. It's great. You know, I'm Canadian-born, Canadian-raised. I'm, I'm just trying to expand my my uh, my fan base here in Canada as well, so this mm. really helps me out. I feel like I'll get more airtime with Canadian fans, and more people will get to know me and hopefully appreciate my fighting style and, 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 and follow me. Well, this is a great opportunity uh, to do that. I think we've got six Canadians on the card. We're people that train in Canada anyway, Canadians. Yeah. And uh, 
yep. there's a lot of talk in Vancouver about the excitement of this event and people are looking forward to it. So that's got to feel great being able to fight yep. your home country in front of your, your own people and not being somewhere where they might be chanting USA, USA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I love it. I can't wait to live it on yeah, Saturday nice. night. Well, Eamon, before we go, is there anything that I missed that you'd like to mention or anybody you'd like to thank before we go? No, I just want to say, like, if anybody wants to learn from Faraz Zahabi and they're not in Montreal, just visit jujiclub.com. I'll make sure I put a link for that, too. I, I've met, I've run into your brother probably about three or four times in the past couple of months. Just uh, the, the MMA yep. scene here in Ontario and Quebec at Samurai has been nuts. It's so busy. I'm, I'm all over the place. And he's always there, of course. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a great yeah. ambassador. I think you are too. So I'm really excited to watch you fight this Saturday yeah, night. You. And I'm sure everyone watching is going to wish you the best of luck. Eamon, thank you. I know it's fight week. It's busy. You're probably cutting weight and you're still have a smile on your face and you seem yeah. happy to speak with me. So I truly appreciate yeah. that. And thank you for pushing through these technical issues with me. And I wish you the best of luck on Saturday night. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Okay. There you go. Fight fans. Eamon's a hobby fighting at UC 289 this Saturday night. In Vancouver, wish him luck. Make sure you buy the pay-per-view and watch for yourself unless you're going to be there in person.